Welcome to another episode of Money for Nothing, the podcast about music and capitalism. I'm Saxon Baird, and on today's episode, you'll be hearing a great interview between Sam and Sherry Hu of Water and Music. They'll be discussing the future of AI and music. Sherry is an extremely insightful person, and we're always happy to have her on the show, especially when it comes to this kind of topic. Basically, the framework of the interview is that right now, the seeds of the future of AI and music are being sown and planted. And so Sam and Sherry discuss a number of topics, but also try to look a little bit into the crystal ball as to what it may hold for the future. As always, please rate and review us, subscribe to our newsletter, moneyfornothing.substack.com. Got some exciting stuff coming up that we can't tell you about yet, but we're very excited about it. So keep staying tuned and keep subscribing. But until then, Enjoy the interview. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Okay, so I guess to start with, I wonder if we could like, I think that one of the difficult things about the conversations around AI and music right now is that they seem to me to lump a lot of different potential or current applications of sometimes the same, sometimes different technologies and kind of like lump them all together as AI and and at one level i think that's like that's like totally that's totally valid and accurate because they are kind of being driven by the same set of or shaped by the same set of kind of like uh technological forces but in other cases i think it can like serve to c- confuse the issue a bit so so i thought it might be really useful to like um start by kind of stepping back and kind of breaking out the kind of ai landscape into kind of like a couple different categories and then like briefly talking about them. And so like I, from where I'd be really interested to hear how you're thinking about this. From my perspective, there's kind of like three and a half distinct, like almost completely different kind of categories of AI applications. It seems like right now that people are playing with and exploring Um, maybe like three and two hats, (laughs) but uh, so I thought maybe I could just like lay them out and get your take on a like whether you think that that's an accurate read on the situation at all, and then b like we can kind of talk through them or whatever other categories that I have missed that that, that you propose. Sounds great. Yes. Okay. So the first one is this kind of I would call it like uh like audio deep fakes. This is like we're in like the the girl talk period <laughs> of AI. That's like hard on your sleeve. Yes, love it. That's like all of the 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 innumerable trash, like really bad YouTube videos of Joe Biden and Trump rapping. Um which is like <laughs> I I like the actually the AI deep there there's like the the AI deep fake vocals of trump and biden like discussing hardcore scene politics i have to admit like does tickle my funny bone but (laughs) but uh yeah just so like the vocal deep fakes both like quite skillful and like absolute trash and and maybe with that i guess like what i I assume will soon be like other kinds of 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 deep fakes whether that's like make my guitar sound like Jimi hendrix or whatever and that kind of slides into number two which is uh in some ways, like I would say, like the, it seems like the most established form of, of, of AI help, um, which is production help, right? This is like the wide variety of machine learning based tools to help musicians, often professional, but not exclusively professional musicians, make their music sound better. And I think some of this has been like fairly well established, right? Like uh, GarageBand has like an auto EQ, and I assume it uses some sort of machine learning. And then the third, I guess, is this kind of is like is like text to sound, which seems like, you know, where like the big LLM guns are. And then like the halves, maybe songwriting help, uh, which is, I would say, like kind of in between text generation and music production. And then also I would say the kind of like uh, 
the uh like the Holly Herndon of it all. Like the the like avant-garde improvising with machines part of the part of the world. I was thinking, yeah, does that like kind of vibe with how how I'm interested to see how, how that fits with with um I think your much more nuanced perspective on this, especially from kind of, of an in, in an industry perspective. Yes. I think actually most of this lines up with um so I guess what what uh, I'm glad that you did is um I guess label all the different areas of music AI not by um what's happening not not so much by what's happening under the hood as by like the actual front facing use case. So I guess normally how mm-hmm. in the research and reading that I've been doing on AI, um, which sometimes can get more technical, I've been thinking about like the actual, I guess, like machine learning methods that are being applied to these use cases. So like audio deepfakes, yeah. um, which I guess is a form of timbre transfer, but specifically for voice. So like taking, sure. yeah, like taking one human voice and uh, translating it to another voice. That is totally um, a big, I think what's interesting about that area of um, generative AI is that um that certainly with like the deep fake Drake songs of the world is what I think put the commercial implications of music AI onto the mainstream stage and like got, you know, people who know yeah. nothing about AI talking about it. And also like certainly is not unique to the music industry. Like I think a lot of uh, older legacy actors have used voice AI to be able to record voiceovers for films, like for movies where they otherwise would not have been able to uh like go in the studio uh or kind of record themselves in person um usually for health reasons um you mean they're not in the studio every night late night yeah 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 or like there's um yeah there have been some movies like i think there's a recent star wars movie where they got like an old they, they wanted an older actor to make a cameo but um he like physically could not uh speak in the same way or the same tone as in some of the older Star Wars films. And so they actually partnered mm-hmm. with a voice AI company to recreate his older voice. And sure. Uh, yeah. So tons of applications across entertainment, just to say that for deep fakes. Um, text to sound is definitely um, like quickly emerging just in the last like few months, at least as I'm recording this, so just like, you know, late spring to summer. Um, Because those, so similar to, I guess, like large language models like uh, ChatGPT or Claude coming out of Anthropic. So I guess another, uh, yeah, another helpful lens through which to understand all the different kinds of use cases or like kinds of forms that music AI is taking is, is not just by the use case, but also by the sheer amount of data you need to make it work. So like text to sound, you need like, Mm -hmm huge data sets of like hundreds of thousands if not millions of songs um to be able to create like a general text to music text to sound model um at the level that we're used to seeing with tools like ChatGPT for just text um and of course uh yeah of course the bigger tech companies are the ones kind of right. first coming to the forefront with that so um meta most recently came out with um two separate models, one called music gen and one called audio gen, which are for like text to music and text to sound effects respectively. And it's, it's not only uh, pretty impressive, like there's still some artifacts you can hear in the audio that suggest it's like still not like super high quality. So probably was not at least like probably has not gone through the, you know, like human engineer, like, you know, audio engineer or whatever, but it's like not only a, a, a decent quality, but also totally open source. Oh, just, just on that, because I, I don't quite have access to that. I know that one of the big challenges with that, and it's maybe getting a little bit more into the weeds, but like um, is, is larger structures. And so I've heard it do really well on like static grooves for 30 seconds. But I, I didn't know if you had more access to that, whether um, you've like seen whether these can do uh, more convincing like verse chorus verse constructions or whatever Ooh, okay uh glad you asked so okay there i actually thought you were asking about something 
different when you said large structures, but actually it's related. So there's like, when you think about like the structure of music, there's, okay, hopefully this makes sense. Like if, if I'm envisioning everything in a DAW, there's like duration of the song. So it's like horizontal structure. And then there's mm -hmm. like, uh, like how many tracks you have. So that's like vertical right. structure. Like it's vertical structure. Sure. I think for right now, even with music gen from meta, the current state of music AI models definitely still structures with like longer, definitely still struggles with longer horizontal structure around music. So I think the, the max length of a sample you can generate, um, you know, like a raw synthesized audio sample you can generate from music gen is maybe 30 seconds. Um, definitely mm -hmm. no longer than um, a minute. I think technically it's, it's definitely possible to generate, but the sample just won't turn out well. So yeah, like the, the max length where the generated sample is still like intelligible and makes sense as music to a human ear is still very low. Um, and then when yeah. it comes to like the complexity of instrumentation, I've actually heard if you ask it to generate, uh, like if, if, if you ask Music Gen or Google has a similar model called Music LM that came out a few months earlier. If you ask these models to generate a classic Cuban style salsa song or something. So like just a more general, um, uh -huh. more general guidance on genre, on region. Um, the output would be super convincing yeah. or like it would be like quite good. But if you ask it to generate a uh, different genre, but if you ask it to generate like just a saxophone in a specific style or like just a saxophone melody that would appear in this kind of, in an X kind of song, I think it struggles to generate like that level of instrumentation where it's like really specific that you want. Well, that makes yeah. that makes a ton of sense if you think about training sets, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's just not. I mean, and this is where you're, I, I I imagine and again we're kind of there's. I feel like this conversation is going to be a challenge to not go down endless uh, <laughs> endless rabbit holes. But like in terms of potential partnerships, you know who has an endless set of individual saxophone recordings is the majors because they've got track by track breakdowns of their records. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, <laughs> like that's dude, that's, that's a training data you could get, but not if you're scraping it from like final product r recorded music. Yeah, exactly. To get that. Exactly. To get that level of fidelity on like, like stem breakdowns of songs. Um, you have to go to like all the way to the source of like, uh, what was recorded in the studio. And yeah, um, presumably the labels are, sitting on that um and yeah yeah i think it's a safe i think it's a safe presu presumption they're sitting on yeah your data. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know labels uh the the historical story of labels and data is a very messy one so uh no one truly knows but yeah, but yeah, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. if you're if you're gonna get it from anywhere you'll you'll get it from labels um but but yes so but these models were trained on we're not trained on that they were trained on kind of just like final finished recordings to your point which leads to, I guess, like two, two use cases you said that are related. So there's like the production angle and the songwriting angle. And so those, mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of zooming in from the very generalist, um, you know, one line outputs a song kind of use case of text to sound or text to music into like very granular applications of AI to yeah. specific components of the creative process. Uh, so yeah, at least in, in the tools that I'm familiar with and that at Water Music we've been tracking. Mm -hmm. I guess, with, so with the exception of uh, these like text to sound models that are coming out, the vast majority of quote unquote music AI tools out there are super fragmented and specific, even with um, like audio deep fakes. So take the Heart on My Sleep, the deep fake Drake song and like the many, many other uh, songs that have come out since that have taken like an AI version of Drake's voice or another celebrity's voice. Uh -huh. In most of those cases, AI is applied only to generating the voice. Usually there still has to be a human producer underneath to, to like lay down the beats and the synths or whatever other part of the production is under the voice. So in, in most cases, these AI models definitely are not good enough where you can click a button and like generate a whole, cohesive song that also happens to have like a celebrity's AI voice 
um usually it's like still like, like these models again going back to you know like the data that was used to train them are like applied to a very specific part of the song so that also applies to um so if you go to like songwriting mm -hmm. there are okay I'll, I'll bring up two examples so google actually partnered with uh lupe fiasco of all people to uh actually a really impressive set of llm tools that are um <laughs> that are aimed <laughs> Um, uh, uh, none of these words are in the Bible. Kick, kick, kind of code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they, they, they part of it, or they had the Bay Fiasco as like a, yeah, launch and creative partner to release, um, a set of LLM tools that actually I know a lot of artists use regularly now. So I, I think they're like pretty useful and impressive, um, aimed at just like general creative writers, but especially rappers. So they have one tool. One specific tool, for example, where you can put in a word, like uh, usually like a longer word, and then um, it'll generate a bunch of ideas for what they call word explosions, which are like like slant rhymes of other words combined um, that like you might not otherwise expect to rhyme with the M um, the M and M of it all. The M and M, yeah, exactly. So just like uh, yeah, so just helping you brainstorm kind of those kinds of lyrical ideas and uh yeah they have like they have an alliteration tool they have like a metaphor tool so like uh they have these very specific use cases um around these llm tools and they're really effective it's so funny because in their specificity it's also yeah. like i feel like those are like those books exist for poets like they have <laughs> like mm. maybe not list of metaphors but certainly like like thesauruses clearly exist and rhyming and rhyming dictionaries like that's a yeah. that's a thing that exists it's just like yes um you know this is like the the um what while w without underplaying the level to which is revolutionary technology this is also sometimes like uber invents the bus vibes oh completely or like elon invents the bus yeah 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 and like yeah i think the I think in general, a lot of the intention with these tools is to like lower the, I guess, yeah, like, I guess lower the barrier to entry to even get to like a decent, like passable, interesting slant rhyme scheme, for example. So like, yeah, like if you, if you have no experience writing poetry, can you write something? Can you start with something with the help of these tools? That's like, uh, mildly interesting of course to like yeah get to something that is heralded as art and like boundary pushing art in the public eye you you probably have to go a few steps or many steps deeper but yes very good point about rhyming dictionary but i guess also to like take that analogy presumably uh again like especially if you don't have any if you if you don't have any experience in a given art form a, co uh, a computer or an AI model can flip through a dictionary much more efficiently than a human can in terms of like, yeah, but in terms of whether the result is like actually intelligible or sure cohesive or kind of relevant to the vision the person has, like you definitely still need that human kind of input and curation. And, and that's really interesting to me, that use case, because in some ways, and, and this is, I think, one of more generally, like one of the big questions about one of the big questions about not even just, I guess, machine learning's application to music, but like maybe at least as it's currently constituted and the trends seem to be playing out, like maybe more generally, which is like, to what extent is this a revolutionary break? And to what extent is this a continuation of trends that we've seen for quite some time? And like, in terms of what you're just talking about with music uh, of lowering the bar for entry to recording, I mean, you could argue that that is the trajectory of recorded music since the sixties, pretty much without, without a pause, you know, like increasing access to recording technology, smaller mixing boards, um, 
you know, uh, the, the explosion of digital sound, which means that like everyone can start, you know, the cost of the studio comes way, 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 way down. Then you get garage band where all of a sudden, like everyone with a Mac can make a halfway decent, you know, if you've got a MIDI plugin, you know, so, so you can play an instrument into your computer and a Mac, you can make a halfway decent sounding album. Um, and that there's been, the, you know, this is continue, you know, and then the, and there are drum loops, there are chord progressions in there, right? This is in some ways, this is revolutionary technology in some ways, but in, in a funny sense, maybe being applied along a trajectory that's actually, it produces a result that's a little bit less different than one might initially think. Yeah, totally. Sorry, is this, is, is, is that the question? Yeah, which is a comment, right? That, that, that it seems <laughs> like, it's, yeah. at, at some ways, yeah. it's like, there's been these kind of like barrier lowering technologies and music for, for a while. Yeah, totally. I, yeah, I think the trend, the general trend of lowering the barrier to entry of who can like uh, create something that can be passed on as music has like, yeah. And every technological change in culture and art has like pointed in that direction. I think where AI and where generative AI um, comes in and actually uh, brings in something different to that wider conversation is the mm-hmm. uh, is opening up the ability to imitate other people. If that makes sense. Like like opening up the ability for yeah um, anyone. Like if you just have a minute or two of Drake vocals, which are probably you know given the size of the internet pretty easy to find yeah uh, nowadays uh there are tools out there that allow you to generate like a voice clone of him in like a matter of minutes like i could do that uh in yeah like less than the time that we've been uh recording so far probably only takes like 15 20 minutes right and uh yeah so like whether through vocals or through like chord like uh, generating chord progressions kind of same thing so i think where um, I've I've said before that AI uh, might be more deeply disruptive to the music industry than uh, piracy, especially mm-hmm. or at least the like Napster era of piracy. And I guess specifically what I mean by that is like really putting this notion of um, intellectual property and what that even is and who owns what if they own anything. Like that, that being like the fundamental question, right alongside the question that I feel was kind of at the the center of the Napster uh, conversation, which was just like, what, like, what, what is the business model around music, and like, how do people access it? Um, this kind of like starts at the level of uh, of creation, like before it even you know gets out to people to be consumed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a really, really good point. So I, I, I want to. And I've got some some question for you, kind of focused on 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 that, the kind of blurring of the lines around IP that this tech these technologies seem to really produce. But but before we move on, I just want to see like because um, I know you've done really extensive industry research around these these technologies. So like, what's the state of play? I guess at a, at a high, you know, maybe not a ten thousand foot level, but like a five thousand foot level, like. You said like a lot of people are using these technologies. How do you have a sense of like how musicians are thinking about these about these tools? Uh, yes. So very high level um, state of play. There are some. I'll just shout out some data sources. And actually, just like a free idea that I'd like to see more of uh, is just doing more like artist surveys on the state of AI. Like I'm actually surprised that there aren't. Um, that many that exist out there, but TuneCore did one pretty big survey on uh, artists, I think mostly their customers, but also some other Mm -hmm. artists just about their feelings on AI. Um, And then we should definitely do another version, but back in February at Water Music, we did a survey of um, around 200 artists and producers just as as part of our research sprint um, for that season around AI. Mm -hmm. And in general, I, yeah, I think I think the sentiment around AI, from my perspective, has has mostly stayed the same since we did that survey back in February. Um, so, how artists are using 
AI is, um, and it's it's kind of a, a chicken or egg issue in terms of whether this is like because it's a limitation of the tool or it's because it's how they prefer to use it, but it's still applying AI to very specific parts of the creative process. Actually, so, okay, to 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 step back and also lay out like the the very different like schools of thought around music AI um, from like on like a philosophical level and and I'll I'll, I'll tie it back to like the the state of play because mm-hmm. I, I do think it is tied to kind of philosophies people have around this. So sure, if you think about I guess how you might be able to divide people who use these music AI tools, there are people there are people who would see music creation as just a means to an end to accomplish something else so like i just need music to create a vibe for my ad on instagram or something or like Mm -hmm. i just need music to uh make sure that i focus better you know while i'm working like music is a conduit to accomplish something else that's like more functional usually um so there's that and then there's people who see music creation as the end in and of itself like they get a ton of joy and and uh value like personal value out of the act of music making so it's it's a very very different state of play i think for those two worlds so uh the the, the second one of people who uh uh-huh. view music as like uh the end in and of itself where they get a lot of value out of it are very passionate about it there are like certain parts of the creative process that they might want to automate and and others that they like certainly do not and want to keep intact um so like trends mm-hmm. that that i've been seeing for example uh so many artists just are like so tired of social media marketing and they um don't want to have to spend a ton of time making graphics to post on you know all the 10 different channels that are out there and so they see a lot of value in like using ai tools to at least make that process faster especially making audio reactive visuals like there's a tool called kyber that i know a lot of music artists are using now to just like generate uh like cooler audio reactive visuals in a shorter amount of time just to help with like marketing and promo so like what do you mean audio reactive visuals yes so like uh visuals that react to the music or that um change gotcha. in live yeah. music so like whenever there's like uh like a a kick or something it like you know a, a right. Kick drum right, right right yeah or like a lot of artists who might be working on like a super tight budget and might not be able to afford like good mix mixing or mastering services at, at a specific point in time like there are there are ai tools that could help um i i don't think it, it gets it to like a professional mastering engineer level but it's a good like start so that's there's that school of thought in the like functional music as a means to an end I I'm actually surprised that there isn't more conversation about what's happening on that side because I feel like that like I guess the existing production music world so you have like the epidemic sounds of the world who are just like releasing music um primarily aimed at like quote-unquote content creators or marketers Mm -hmm. or big brands who just need music for the vast amounts of content they're turning out like I see AI as definitely being a, a threat to that to that business model in the music industry specifically. Um, and there and there are definitely music startups that are not so much aimed at professional musicians who just want to enhance their creative process or creative workflow, but definitely aimed at the group of people who just, you know, see music as a means to an end. Um, and like they're also like the business model is totally different because usually in most cases you're like selling your services to like you're you're doing like enterprise deals with big brands who just want access to you know this tool to generate music. Yeah, and and with the massive proliferation of music and social media and across social media, that's actually like a not insignificant part of the future market. It seems like you know, like like um mm-hmm. a version where everyone's getting kind of uh you know like vibey sounds versus a version where I don't know everyone's getting universal music artists through some sort of other kind of deal. It's a very different world for the music industry as it's currently constituted. Totally. Yeah. And I think um, with a lot of these 
UGC social platforms like Twitch, for example, I know creators have like a huge issue with takedowns on that platform, even still. Um, like if they even include a small amount of copyrighted music in their videos. And so it, from, from the lens of just like addressing major pain points that have existed for years, like there, there really is, uh, an opportunity for like music AI companies to come in and, and, and if they're able to figure out the legal side of things, like just make it a lot easier for creators on those platforms. Which, yeah, which I think does become like kind of existential. I mean, if if music is increasingly moving towards a more fuller integration with creators on, on a whole variety of platforms as like the primary space where everything happens in the entire world. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, that's really interesting to think about those kind of two breakdowns. So there's one that's kind of almost more B2B and then there's one that's more... Um, like traditionally artist focused. Yes. In terms of how people are using these tools. Um, and it sounds like they're using them in, in, in kind of different ways and with kind of different end, end goals. Used in different ways and different angles. Yeah. So there's, I'm, I'm kind of thinking out loud. Uh, so I might correct myself, but I, I think, I think this also is like another way of thinking about kind of this, a similar breakdown is like, are you, yeah, so I guess are like are your are your primary users like professional musicians or not? And I guess this also is expressed in like kind of where you live, just like on the device level. Like, are you a plugin? Like, there, there are a ton of to what you were saying earlier. There are a ton of like DAW plugins, especially mm-hmm. not just in GarageBand, but yeah, basically any like Ableton or Logic that already use AI in some way, like uh, Isotope which I think just merged with Native Instruments recently um, is an example of a company that has like tons of different plugins that use AI in, some, in very specific ways, like just for mixing or just for mastering. So there's, whereas uh, most of the music AI tools that are aimed more at like content creators or like not professional musicians are like mobile apps or mm-hmm. completely like browser-based. Like you, you just go to a website and can generate music there. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's really interesting because I do think that one of the things um, this is making me think about, and I think I was, I was kind of trying to gesture it, gesture to this quite imprecisely earlier when I was talking about it being kind of existential, is that I think that, um, you know, if you think about, again, about the, the, the previous, that, that Napster moment, right? One of the ways you could think about, like, think about how to describe what happened in that moment. Like you were saying, um, is that what's a business model for the music industry? And it, and one of the ways that, that um, you could describe that business model is huge parts of it became the tech industry, right? Like this is the kind of classic YouTube was initially <laughs> primarily a platform for pirated music. And that drove a huge amount of value creation or the iPod being launched in europe when there wasn't an apple store yet i think in the u.s too but don't like quote me on that you know what i mean that there are these massive amounts of value extraction as like what is the quote-unquote music industry and kind of under the purview of artists um who consider themselves musicians and what becomes part of like a broader industry shifts and i think that maybe you're also seeing that again a little bit in this split you're describing here right like it matters a lot, it seems to me, whether, again, possible futures. Like, if there's a possible future where a lot of this stuff is being created by companies that understand themselves as making, you know, focused on music <laughs> in some way, right? Like, as tied to that part of the industry versus ones that are like, oh, no, we're mostly making, like, sound uh, or audio for content creators so that we can like handle the whole music thing. And it's being designed for people who don't think of themselves as musicians. It can seem like a slight difference, but I actually think that like how that space gets carved up uh, uh, is likely to end up having some pretty serious implications down the line. By carved up, meaning like who, who ends up like taking uh, like the biggest chunk of those respective sides. Yeah, who ends up taking the biggest chunk, yeah. how... You know what ends up being the kind of go to, uh, go to program or go to method. How are those integrated with the platforms? Because I imagine that the platforms are like actively trying to integrate this stuff to make, uh, you know, 
in as easy as possible for the creators to use. And just like what industry that ends up in. Yeah, I think I, I imagine like mattering quite a bit. Oh, um, a lot. And I think there are already signs of uh, this kind of vertical integration happening on the tech side already. So like, yeah, still still speculation for the time being, but I imagine the power players uh-huh. would be even more tech companies than rights holders. Um, or maybe they'll become uh, one of the same. Oh, I have, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. I just thought of this like, or I, I had this like crazy idea that I heard at um, Mutech Montreal when I was there that I'll kind of end this thought on. But okay, so there are, sorry, there are three specific examples, three specific kinds of companies. So one is ByteDance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess uh, TikTok, which is one of their biggest apps, if not their biggest app. Um, I would be hard to imagine that they have a bigger app than TikTok. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. It's, it's no, true. no. I I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, neither am I, but I'm like, what? what's its name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good, good point. Good point. Very fair. Uh, yeah. So it's to me, it's clear that ByteDance and TikTok in particular are like very actively trying to verticalize the music industry under their roof. So um, obviously they have still like one of the most uh, powerful like music discovery engines in the world through TikTok. Um, Mm -hmm. So they have that. TikTok just uh, recently launched their own distribution tool called SoundOn, which is like a Uh like CD Baby DistroKid competitor. And I believe there's some integration between SoundOn and TikTok. It just makes it like easier, especially if you want to uh, submit your music for inclusion in like their library that goes out to brands that they can use in their in their videos. I think like there's some integration there. TikTok Music, I believe, is being tested in a few markets right now. So they're also even experimenting with their own um, like paid streaming service. So then competing with the Spotify and mm-hmm. Apple Music of the world. So so they have the they have the distribution, they have the marketing, um, and they have like I guess consumption as distinct from social sharing, um, kind of on one. Yeah, and this is distribution that runs in parallel to the deals. Correct. The majors. Yes. ByteDance also happens to have, uh, just in terms of like the people working there, I think one of the best music AI research teams. Like they they've recruited a lot of, uh, like really good engineers that have worked in music for a long time to try to build tools oh yeah they they mm-hmm. just um they, they have a tool in beta called ripple i believe that just makes it easier for people to start like generating musical ideas yeah it's like a it's a mobile app by by dance out of all the like big tech companies globally i think like they they most publicly planted all the seeds to try to create some like connected thing in-house so like you like if you're an artist and you don't know where to start you know you can go to bite dance for everything so like creating a song um i don't think they're making a daw so i guess that's like the one thing missing but um only a matter of time i guess but then so yeah you generate your idea and then once you make your song you can use their distribution tool get discovered on tiktok and then uh get paid some amount of royalties through um being on their like streaming service that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Oh no, and, and it, it's it's fascinating because it's so um well for one, like if you wanted to fundamentally change the the potential power structure of the music industry, if songs didn't just start blowing up on TikTok, but they were being generated within TikTok as a closed not quite a closed garden, but you know what I mean? Like that would be a real threat to the system as it's currently constituted. And what you're saying again about the kind of the the creation of this full stack of tools to encourage that it's really it it puts a totally different spin on mm. on a lot, a lot of the kind of like techno deterministic visions of ai right cuz it, it's what it suggests to me is that in this very heated kind of cold war this very heated cold war between these kind of various ultra major major players in the in the music industry um, all of whom have to cooperate with each other to a certain extent, but all of whom are are, are constantly trying to like 
squeeze more of the profits off of the value chain and then create leverage to enable them to better negotiate with each other. You know, like if hits are being generated within TikTok, that gives TikTok better leverage the next time their deal with the majors is up for, you know, to pull an example that certainly has no relationship to reality. Um, (laughs) And it's just interesting to think about real substantive investments in AI technologies, not as this like, either it's the, it's the future and the singularity (laughs) or the sky is falling, but like as another, as another potential path forward in the arms race between these companies that's been happening for a while anyway, as they like try to like elbow, elbow each other out of the way. basically. Totally. Um, yeah, I think th- so. This, this is, this is an example of, this is another example of a trend that has been happening for a while. Um, of, yeah, what you're just saying of like tech companies and um, rights holders, the, the, the music tech cold war. I th- that's, that's a very like neat, phrase <laughs> i'll be i i'll probably uh adapt that for future writing but yeah like that that kind of like that that tension between those two sides um has been around for as long as yeah piracy and streaming have been around um what's new is is at the, uh, again at the level of ip and copyright and like the bigger question of like who owns what um and what that means in terms of leverage so yeah i think like by dance and TikTok are in, I think the like loudest position yeah. to kind of like take that stance. That said, the so the I guess second big tech company example in my mind is Meta, um, because actually in so in the announcement, this this is actually really rare with like more technical AI blog posts or company press releases. Um, around like new models uh-huh. that are released, which are normally developer focused, but in Meta's announcement post for their two latest um, like music and sound effect AI models, music gen and uh, and audio gen, they opened up with use cases. So I think the language was like, imagine a uh, you're a video game developer um, who needs. Uh, easier access to music to include in a certain scene or imagine you are a small business um, on Instagram. I don't think they mentioned Instagram, but uh, they basically were pointing to that app. I think like imagine you're a small business owner who um, uh-huh. is like, Oh yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw exactly this. I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. I'm like, Oh wow. You're, you know, you're not supposed to say this part out loud. Like, you're not supposed to say like, oh, all of those musicians, you won't have to hire them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was surprised as well. So yeah, it's, um, I, I, I'll have to look at the numbers because I don't think, I think relatively speaking, I don't think Facebook slash Meta slash Instagram are paying out that much in royalties to rights holders. Like definitely not at the level that um, like, uh other dsps or that that like traditional dsps are paying out but it's but in terms of because i thought the instagram deal the instagram deal was relatively Mm -hmm. late was my memory um and like pretty hard fought for a Um, while um yeah so i think that's still still remains to be seen what like the the financial value that is to the music industry but yeah to like to have these like still very important like social communication channels around music um and i i feel like with like apple's vision pro vr or ar is like gonna kind of make a comeback or like just will be back at the forefront starting next year and so and then also like as meta to have to own something like oculus which is like definitely one of the bigger um VR platforms, at least in terms of like number of headsets that are out there, VR, yeah. to to have that and then to say something like this exactly, where it's like, oh, we we not only have like the, those distribution channels, but now we're like we uh, have developed one of the best models, at least to date, um, for like generating music in a way that can like support these creators on our platform. Um, it's very it's a very very loud statement. So. 
uh yeah in in, in favor yep. of one mm-hmm. group of people instead of the other i i i want to also kind of in this space an interesting and unclear exactly what it means at all is the umg youtube Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um which you know for those keeping score at home is the largest record label umg forming like a ai music incubator with like a really weird set of artists and like the the sinatra estate um with youtube which is of course google so in some ways like not the biggest, but among the biggest tech companies and the biggest music industry, music business, um, sorry, record label, like teaming up in a really vague, and unclear way where they say like, we're going to make money for everyone and respect artists, but also use this new technology. It was a lot of words to say exa- exactly nothing. I completely agree. I So I was seeing headlines around, yeah, it being like an incubator. Um, around music AI and I was uh, super excited from the vantage point of someone who's like trying to follow the cutting edge of what's being developed on the tech side and like new startups and tools that are coming up uh-huh. so, yeah the post itself was like completely different um, not only was it did it not mention anything about like any tooling being developed but also like the artists mentioned were not like yeah mostly like legacy artists uh and not it's like legacy and global no, no one courted the u.s no, market. no one courted the u.s market um and no one who had a track record at least to my knowledge of being like very proactive and experimenting with ai or at least had like like demonstrated knowledge of uh-huh. how the tech worked where they would be cool to have in like an incubator setting to like experiment with these tools it yeah it was it was saying um i okay uh not music related at all but um i have a friend who's a we work member and a few weeks ago he got an email uh-huh. um saying like r.i.p we we value our members and are committed to uh giving them the best experience and uh we're working hard and like that was it it, it didn't even like announce anything <laughs> is it like like we didn't like that that would i feel like something is about to close or shut down or something but they didn't, they didn't give any hint of that it's we work yeah it's, for... <laughs> it's we work <laughs> yeah. yeah so really anything could happen um but i got like not not as uh not as egregious but similar vibe from this this post of like where it, okay uh there, there, there's also sorry another meme reference there's a meme on Twitter going around. Um, there's a tech exec or investor who tweeted that he was in the arena trying things and like so, 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 some things will work and some things won't work and we'll see what happens. And it was just, it was just so vague. And now it's just that, that phrase like in the arena trying things is now everywhere uh, on Twitter. So <laughs> it's, it's really funny. That's definitely the vibe I get. So, I mean, so in, in this like big tech conversation, Google has not come up that much, but but I mean they are for sure the most prolific like research org in music AI, or like one one of the most prolific in terms of the amount of like models they've released um, and how long they've been in the field publishing. So through Google Magenta, they like they they have published plugins that are open source and they are free, so any artist can use them. Um, for and and all of those are are they're, they're not text to music or text to sound they're like generating chord progressions or like applying they have a lot of good like timbre transfer models so like like translating like a piano sound into a sax sound or something they have really good models for that especially given they have something like youtube it's it's very interesting that they've been in the in the arena for so long and have not commercialized anything yeah i mean I- unless you think content id counts oh i see yeah, uh, I guess that, that that is a form. It's a different form of machine learning, but not in like a content generation sense. I no, guess that, at least not explicitly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's also interesting because they're the, I mean, 
at least last time I checked, far and away the largest digital streaming platform. Uh, yes, especially if you look, um, especially if you look globally at like how people are consuming music, for sure. Like, in in all the quote unquote emerging markets, um, or like outside the U.S. and EU, um. I think YouTube's like the biggest by far. And and, yeah. and that's one where I feel like, yeah, no, they, they promised a whole lot of nothing. So we're gonna like gonna encourage us both to get out over our skis a little bit. Um because I I, I mean and, and like imagine like what an actual partnership between UMG and YouTube around AI could look like. Like what would be the actual benefits and there's a really i don't know if you saw there's a wonderful article on the on the verge about about this negotiation kind of arguing and i'm not sure i'm convinced by it but kind of arguing that this seemed like on one hand an agreement to do like some opt-in ai licensing for you know user generated content but also it seemed like a uh YouTube kind of bending the knee a little bit to the major IP rights holders and saying like, we're what we're really developing here is a system of kind of new IP based rules to kick stuff that major IP holders see as infringing on their intellectual property, even if that's not structured like by copyright law as it currently exists. And like allowing them to, to 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 kind of continue controlling the audio market. Again, I'm not sure if I, I buy that fully, but I thought it was kind of a provocative read on what that what like what that partnership could mean if if it means anything at all. Uh yeah. No, I have I still have to read that that um Verge article, but the exact same read. I mean, like meta when they released Music Gen, they said it was all on um, licensed music or music that was already like open Creative Commons, like CC0 um, licensed music. And there are like tons of like open public data sets of music online that are not like copyrighted in the traditional sense um, or just have like much more open licensing terms. Um, yeah, and they like they, they just built the model and released it. and. Uh, I mean, I imagine they're having conversations with major rights holders about like implications of having this model out there, but they just did it. Like, I think the fact that YouTube, so yeah, Google has, well, importantly, okay, importantly, Google's music LM model, I think was trained in part on YouTube music data. That's a big part of which certainly is copyrighted and sure. like, probably so that model is not open to the public probably because they haven't like properly licensed it but yeah i think it's 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 it sends a huge statement about like the the i guess ironically google and youtube taking like a more cautious versus like proactive like let's just like get get this out there uh they have a lot more skin in the game right like that's true if YouTube gets into a huge fight with the major labels, like they lose the Justin Bieber catalog. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is a bigger threat. Like, I mean, yeah, I guess losing the Justin Bieber catalog is a big deal for Instagram, which is basically just like a video, uh, a video app at this point, (laughs) almost, but not the same way that it would be for, for YouTube, which is like still a music app, music site mostly. Yeah, totally. And then they would, yeah, they would uh, lose, like, a huge source of, like, consumption usage for them. That's true. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to introduce slight, not slight curveball, but the, like, crazy idea that I uh, uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier. Now now that we're oh, talking yeah, about... yeah, uh, yeah. Curveball now, away. Now that we're deep in this topic of, like, yeah, big tech companies and their, their positioning in AI. Um, have to give credit to Yotam Mann, who is like longtime musician and music technologist, um, founder of, co-founder of Never Before Heard Sounds, which is uh, just building really interesting tooling around music AI models. And they also work with Holly Herndon 
to build uh, V1 of her voice model. He was on the panel that we did, uh, like uh, the panel that Water Music did at New Tech Montreal in, on August 25th. And he randomly, uh, we were talking about, the, the panel was talking about training data and he randomly brought up the thought experiment of what if OpenAI became the next hypnosis? I think the context was just about um, about resources, yeah, and and which players in the industry have the resources to build models that are high quality. And I think there there were some kind of counter responses. Like I think the tech is there for artists to build really interesting models that are fine-tuned on a smaller amount of very focused data. So like Holly Herndon's voice model is a perfect example of like, you just need to generate, you know, yeah, audio in her voice. Um, that's, so her voice data is like really all you need. Um, right. But when it came to like larger language models, uh, I think what you know, Tom was saying was like, OpenAI is this huge company. Presumably they have a ton of funding. And if they wanted to build, <clears throat> so if they wanted to build a big like, you know, I guess the, the industry defining music generation model, text to music model, they like, what if they just like bought up a bunch of catalogs that they like fully owned and therefore had like full license to do whatever they wanted with it, including training an AI model. And it's, I, I feel like there are many mostly political and probably legal barriers to that happening. Sure but I are. wanted to bring that up. But <laughs> but I wanted to bring that up as like an extreme uh, and ever so slightly possible example of what we're talking about, of like big tech companies in already having a lot of the infrastructure needed to develop and like maintain these larger music AI models, um, starting to have or potentially having a lot more leverage in the music industry, or this, this applies to other areas of entertainment, like the entertainment industry at large compared to what they have right now, which is that there's already like some tension that they have with traditional rights holders. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because it does seem like, you know, thinking two or three steps on the line, like whether or not the hypnosis version would work, it, it is an interesting question about like, okay, if you made like a really, really, really high quality, you know, text to music L LLM, you know, where, where you could really like create in, in conversation with this thing. But then there's this funny, the, the reverse is like, would it, would it matter? And, and by would it matter? I don't mean like, like, would it, would it have any impact on the music industry? Cause of course it would, but like, would it fundamentally change the structures of the music industry and 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 I think that's one of the huge question marks over all of this, which is like, is the thing that's holding people together in the music industry, that's making people shell out, that, you know, that allows Beyonce or Taylor Swift to do their tours, like the things that make pop music still a thing, is like the only thing that, that holds... Um, Holds that together like the barriers to entry in this space, and I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure there it that's true. You know, like in a world in which anyone could put seven words into an LLM or spend a day working with an LLM and produce like a a single ladies level pop song, right? Like really good. I'm not sure that that like gets rid of, I mean, it changes it probably. But I don't know if it gets rid of the kind of needs for shared experience that creates the chokeholds that allow these companies to get power and hold power and then use that power to kind of like manipulate the industries around them. And those companies, whether that, that could mean the major labels, it could also mean the tech companies to a certain extent. I'm um, kind of any any of the 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 the, the platforms as well. Any of the com companies that are kind of in this like culture slash media slash communication space, but it's a really cool thought experiment. What you're suggesting, I think, because it's like 
it kind of you're like okay let's take this to the exponential level like how how would it change things <laughs> and if would it matter you know if it does it matter if 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 it's a uh, a totally outside company like OpenAI or you know the partnership of YouTube and Universal. I have so doesn't... many thoughts. So uh, I guess there are okay. There, there are like two layers. What I just heard, or also like what I'm thinking about in general about future music AI. Also, there's like who. I guess there's like the the market share power question. So like who owns uh, most of the IP. Or like how how is like IP ownership uh, divvied up and kind of uh-huh. yeah I guess like like who who are those players and then like is the distribution of power going to be like more diluted across like like is it is it going to become like less one mega hypnosis and more like ten thousand mini ones yeah is like a question that I've heard yeah 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 um, that makes sense because there is. Yeah, like with with AI and actually a lot of uh, like newer tech movements or paradigms that have come up the last four or five years, like I would say um, the rhetoric behind the Web3 hype of the last few years is very similar, like wanting Mm -hmm. to um, distribute wealth in, yeah, like like, like, wanting to redistribute funds in the music industry much more equitably, bring more of that uh, earning power to like independent artists. Or like artists outside of the one uh, percent, top one percent. Mm-hmm. But I totally so so in terms of like who, in terms of who um, is like originating the IP that will be generated in the AI first world. I do think tech companies will be sitting on a lot more of those songs just by nature of like owning a lot of the tools that people will be using to make music like a larger amount of music in a shorter amount of time mm-hmm. as far as what will yeah so like it's i think this is like in in yeah. part like a, a marketing shtick like, yeah like boomy for example that's interesting they're a music ai startup that's um definitely aimed at like content creators or like non-professional musicians and they've been around for several years and at the bottom of their site they have a ongoing ticker of like how many songs have been generated i think they're at like over 10 million 12 million um and like they 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 define songs as i guess like one to two minute snippets that have been generated using their tool um and like not all of them are on dsps like officially in the market so to speak but like that's but that that's like a start many of yeah you can imagine you know where meta or google would sit yeah yeah so Tech companies will sit on a lot of these songs. In terms of what will, um, what people will actually care about, I, I, I do agree that like the, the mechanics, of or not okay actually not even mechanics just like what on on the high abstract level like what draws people to a song, is, um has so much to do yeah. with things around the song. Like not just the song itself, like the the story behind the artist, the narrative around the song, um, the social networks that's it circulates through. Totally, totally, yeah. Like the 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 scenes that liking the song, like kind of gives you an entry into exactly. So there's there's so many other factors around the song that I think will become even more uh critical uh for yeah for people who are looking to like reach an audience and build a career this is also a really good example of something that has already been happening in the industry for for so long of yeah like in in a world where like content or like music saturation is like already a huge issue uh of there being you know millions of songs that have not gotten any place yeah. yeah on dsps probably the kind of the the marketing around the music is uh becoming has become more critical um well, yeah i mean i would even say like it's not just like the marketing around the music I, w- I would i would push it a little bit further and say like there's a new paradigm for what music is and it's not just mm. recorded sound anymore um mm. that that what we're getting to is a place that you know and arguably like the, the the historical perspective i think is that 
music definitely wasn't just recorded sound for most of its history. Even like, you know, like early uh, until like till the 40s, I would say it's not just recorded sound. I mean, you could argue that really like, right. The Beatles, when they stop touring and they're able to be a global phenomenon, despite not appearing live, is maybe like the epitome of that. That music is purely recorded sound. But like it, it seems to me like that's a, a definition that changes over time and that maybe we're entering a period where it looks a lot more like music is sound and also social media and also you know, fan community and, you know, this kind of diverse set of human interactions that are structured around and with, you know, human organized sound, because, you know, it's that awkward thing where you can't keep saying music, human organized sound um, is a central part of it and an organizing factor. But like where the, where the lines of that medium are, are shift. I love this. I'm, I'm, I'm processing, but yeah, I, so uh thinking out loud but i have thought a lot in the last few months about how uh definitely like live communal events and gatherings of people will feel Uh even more like critical or even more valuable just in in the society at large but especially in in music and especially in a world where you know uh, a piece of media will be uploaded and it'll be increasingly difficult to figure out whether or not it's real. I guess there's a separate conversation about like, yeah, like what situations that that will matter versus not matter. But I think like as human beings, we'll still want to some, some sign that life is real and that like other people are real <laughs> and that <laughs> like, you know, our, our friendships and relationships are real. And so like, IRL gatherings will become even more important on like on a macro level I think yeah it's been interesting to see like the live music business um continue to grow in spite of uh or maybe everything yeah <laughs> it's, it's in spite of everything and especially in contrast to just the struggle at least in music to build something sustainable digitally so yeah yeah and I, I really I really like that phrase of sound as an organizing factor to put a more or like to bring in like a more cynical spin that also is not new something that's often said on the industry side is music is really good at selling everything but music yeah no i think that's true music as a loss leader right it's because yeah yeah no i think that's that's true throughout the 20th century certainly and the 21st yeah so yeah certainly yeah it's not new it's becoming more and more of a phenomenon and in an AI first world. Yeah. I guess just uh, like any artist trying to work in the industry will have to grapple with that in terms of what it means for uh, like how they, how they spend their time grappling with, or, or just, just, I guess, trying to like really understand like where, where they personally find value and then where like people uh, who they're like creating with and creating for, you know, where they actually find value. Yeah, it'll like increasingly, I think, shift to whether it's live events or like the social stories around music online, offline. Yeah, that'll just become even more important. I guess in summation, good luck, kids. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> um, oh, Sherry, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show and this was like a tremendously useful conversation. Um, you've got such a great perspective on these like all consuming issues. <laughs> yeah, no, likewise, always a pleasure to chat and be a guest. Um, yeah, thank you for asking great questions and yeah, a lot, I guess like major takeaway with at least like current state of things is that like yeah all all the seeds are are being planted right now of like these i think these like mega structures that are going to be built around ai specifically so yeah it'll be interesting to see how how it all plays out